let's have a look quickly. So Euclidean geometry is what we're going to be focusing on today. And the purpose of what we're doing is to remind ourselves of the theorems in geometry. It's a big chunk of your paper two. Um, it is the last section of your paper two exam right at the end when you're tired. And it's often a section that we're scared of or that we just want to leave out. So I'm hoping today that we can remind ourselves of the basics of the theorems and practice the basics so that we can bank the easy marks in that section. Okay, so the question is, how do we do this? Well, we don't panic. We don't panic. Guys, we don't panic. Matrix, we don't panic. So the one thing I want to start with today is that there are going to be hard questions in geometry. Expect them, but let them be. We're not worried about the really tough questions. We want to get the ones that we can bank and focus on in the beginning. So we're going to read, 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 and we're going to focus on the first few questions of each section. Okay. So Euclidean geometry, like I said, it feels so hard. I want you all to look at the board quickly. Look at the board. Make sure you're all staring at the board. Nobody's staring at their desks. Have a look at this. Guys, we can do hard things. So right from the get-go, I want you to believe that there are marks in this section that you guys can definitely get. And we're going to focus on that today. Okay, so... The first hour, we're going to tackle a little bit of grade 11 circle geometry. We're going to focus on the reasons and question eights. And then second hour, we're going to go a little bit deeper into circle geometry. We're going to make it a bit more fun and we're going to look at the questions which don't have any numbers. So there's two questions that we're going to look at there. Then hopefully I factored in a little bit of a break so you guys can go to the toilet um, and then we're going to tackle the grade 12 geometry for the last hour. So it's going to be a jam packed session, but you're going to have a lot of opportunity to practice. OK, so I don't want to spend too long chatting. What must you remember for geometry? Reasons, 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 grade 12s, matrix. You have to remember your geometry reasons. There are so, so many places in this paper where you can get easy marks if you have memorized your reasons, your reasons. And I think there's one more. Nope, that was our last one. OK, so the absolute vital thing for today is to memorize your reasons. So let's go through a few of them. In grade eight and nine, we learned about the basics that angles on a straight line add up to 180. That angles in a 90 degrees with the little square, little block, they add up to 90. That angles around a point add up to 360. And that vertically opposite angles in a crisscross will be equal. Okay, so that's all the way from grade eight and nine, which we mustn't forget even going into um, grade 12. So if you have a look, if I have two vertical lines that crisscross, then vertically opposite angles are equal. There's a few more. We then learned about our parallel line theorems, and I call these the fuzz, the fuzz theorems, because we have an F, we have a U, and we have a Z. Okay, so the Z shape tells me that our alternate angles are equal. Our F shape tells us that the angles in the armpits are equal. And our U shape tells us that the angles inside the U, they're not equal, but they add up to 180. <clears throat> and the most important thing here is every time you are using an alternate angles, a corresponding angles or co-interior angles, you have to have to label the parallel lines. They are very, very strict about this in the final exam. OK, the last thing we learned in grade eight to nine were our triangles. And we know that the interior angles of a triangle will add up to 180 degrees. So inside my triangle, 180 degrees. The next triangle theorem is a little bit more interesting. It says that if I have um, two angles inside a triangle, then I can add the two angles together and I will get the exterior angle on the other side. So your exterior angle of a triangle theorem is another very popular one. They sneak this in to Euclidean quite a lot. OK, so keep an eyeball out of it. 
Uh, you want to make sure that you see it, or if you see a triangle that you don't forget to maybe look for an exterior angle. And then the last two over here, and these are the ones I want to remind you about a little, is your isosceles triangle. Now we know if I have a triangle with two sides that are equal in length, then the angles at the end of those lengths are equal. And often we mark exams and you guys get this reason wrong. So if I am saying that angle B is equal to angle C, then my reason is going to be angles opposite equal sides. So if I'm stating an angle, my reason is going to start with angles opposite equal sides. And we get so many different variations. Unfortunately, we are very strict. So I don't want to see isosceles triangles or equal sides, equal angles, anything like that. You must memorize this one. If B equals C, it is because of angles opposite equal sides. If they give it to you the other way, so they tell you that the angles are equal, then you know that these two sides must be same. So if you're going to say that DE is the same as DC because the angles are equal, then you're going to say, look, the side of DE is equal to the side of DC because of sides opposite equal angles. So your reason is what you have. So if I am stating that the angles are the same, then I'm starting with angles on the opposite equal sides. If I'm stating that the sides are equal, then I'm going to start with sides opposite equal angles. Sneaky ones, those two. Okay, so this is a nice summary. You might have seen the grade 12 exam guidelines. They have listed all of the reasons that you have to use in the guideline. Teachers, you can download this off the Western Cape Education Department portal. We can send it to you guys. It's very important, learners, that you memorize all of these theorems. Okay, and you know most of them already. Okay, today we're focusing on Euclidean geometry. And like I told you, we're focusing on grade 11, which is your circle geometry. And I just want to remind you, don't forget Mr. Radius. Mr. Radius is the most overlooked part of circle geometry. If you have the center of a circle, then any radius from there will have the same length. Okay, so let's remind ourselves quickly about our grade 11 circle theorems. So I'm going to focus on the, the popular ones and then I'm going to give you the best cheat sheet in the world. So get your, um, your phone ready so you can take a photo. If you're using a computer, you can screenshot the picture. This is the best cheat sheet. But let us go through the theorems quickly. One of the first theorems we learned about was the angle at center theorem. It says that if I have an angle at the center of a circle, then the angle at the circumference of the circle is going to be half the size. So the angle at the middle is twice as big as the angle at the circumference. And we are very used to this left circle over here. However, they sometimes trick us with two more pictures. So they can make the triangle, they can move this point down so that it lines up exactly over your radius. And then sometimes it's a little bit harder to see. But remember, your angle at the center is always going to be twice as big as your angle at the circumference. The one that they also like to trick you is when they bring this point even further down and it looks like a bow tie. And you guys will get confused and you think, oh, there's a bow tie. But remember, your angles in the same segment must have all four points on the circumference. So this is a sneaky, sneaky angle at center. OK, and then the other one that they like to do is they like to give it to you like this, where they have a little what looks like a cyclic quad, but it's not a cyclic quad because this point is in the middle and it's not on the circumference. So in this one, we've got to be super duper careful. The angle at the middle is actually this reflex angle, 360 minus 2x, and the angle at circumference is down here, 180 minus x. For all of these pictures, the reason that you write in your answers is the longest reason we have angle at center equals two times angle at circumference. Okay, 
Right, so that's a popular theorem. The next theorem is related. It's our bow tie theorem, and it's talking about angles in the same segment. It comes from our angle at center theorem. So if you have a look here, you'll see that if I have my angle at center is 2x, and I draw angle at circumference over there, angle at circumference, they're both going to be x. If I now remove my middle bit, I've got angles in the same segment. And if I do a little bit of manipulation, I could draw it upside down and I would get a whole bunch of equal angles. So we can see that the dots are going to be the same, the stars are going to be the same, and the crosses are going to be the same. And for this one, we affectionately call it the bow tie theorem because we're looking for a bow tie. But just remember that you're not ever going to use bow tie as your reason. Your reason is angles in the same segment. OK, <clears throat> a little offshoot of angle at center is when our angle at the center is 180 and then we land up with 90 at the circumference. This has got its own special name. It's called angles in a semicircle. And for this one, you keep, need to keep an eye out for the word diameter. Every time you see the word diameter, you've got to think, OK, let me check. Have I got an angle in a semicircle? OK, after that guy, we've got another one that pops up a little bit sneaky. It's when they give us two triangles that have equal chords. So if I have a triangle here with AC, and another triangle with EF, and these lengths or these chords are the same length, then the angles that they make are also going to be equal. And this one is called equal chords, equal angles. Right, we've got a few more to go. We've got our opposite angles of a cyclic quad, which comes from our angle at center theorem. So if I have a cyclic quad, now let's just remind ourselves, what does a cyclic quad mean? It's a quad in a circle and it's very important all four points must be on the circumference okay all four points on the edge of the circle if you have one of those points in the middle of the circle it's not a cyclic quad but if i have a cyclic quad then the opposite angles will always add up to 180. We have another kind of cyclic quad where they give us the exterior angle. So in other words, they extend the angle a little, um, the side. Okay, so if you have a look here, they've given me a cyclic quad. And I know that the opposite angle is going to be 180 minus X because I know opposite angles of a cyclic quad must add up to 180. But I also know from grade eight that angles on a straight line also add up to 180. And so that outside angle is going to be X as well. And so your exterior angle of a cyclic quad rule looks like that. OK, so we've got center theorems. We've got two cyclic quad theorems. Let's have a look now at tangents. OK, because there's some theorems that talk about a tangent. A reminder, a tangent is a line that touches a circle. It doesn't intersect a circle, it touches a circle. Okay, so my favorite theorem is the tan chord theorem, which says that if I have a tangent to a chord, then the angle between the tangent and the chord, that angle there, must be equal to the angle that this chord makes inside the circle. It's great to do this one using your fingers. So go from the tangent to the chord, there we go. Then put your finger on A and your other finger on the other hand on B and move towards the edge of the circle. And that is your X over there. Okay, <clears throat> we can obviously find tan chord theorem from the other side. So if that is my angle between the tangent and the chord over here, I put my finger on D, I put my other finger on B and I go up to the circumference that's also going to be y. I can even go from my tangent to this chord. Then I put my finger on B, I put another finger on C, and I go to the circumference, and you'll notice that angle A will also be y, um, will be whatever the angle is. Okay, so tan chord theorem, very popular. 
Your tangent touching your radius is also a popular theorem. It will always be 90. This one's easy to spot. It's tan perpendicular to radius. Now be careful. You guys often confuse this with line from center theorem. And I'm going to talk about line from center theorem in a minute. Lastly, we have our tangents from a common point. If I have two tangents from a point that touch the circle, then those two lengths, AP and AC, are going to be equal. Which means I have a little isosceles triangle, and I have tan chord theorem, which makes all those angles equal to B as well. And that one is called tangents from the same point, or tangents from a common point. Okay, so that's a little summary. Now, proofs. Remember, Euclidean geometry can be a tough section, but we can do hard things. But there is one part of this section that is guaranteed easy, and that is your proofs. So there are five theorems for circle geometry that you need to memorize like a parrot and your teachers will be able to give this to you. It is five marks guaranteed one of these five questions. And if you answer nothing else, you can go in and you can bank the proof of line from center, the proof of angle at center equals two times angle at circumference, the proof of cyclic quads, or the proof of the tan chord theorem. OK, they are one, two, three, four, four, maybe five theorems that you can study. OK, I'm not going to go through that now because um, I want us to spend some time practicing. OK, let's just close this one. Uh, give me a second. OK, so don't forget your proofs. So where do we start? Well, this is that cheat sheet I was telling you. Every time you look at a grade a circle geometry question, you ask yourself, do I have the center of the circle? If you have the center of the circle, you can look for these four theorems. Your line from center perpendicular to chord or line from center to midpoint of chord. Your angle at center equals two times angle at circumference. Your angles in a semicircle or your tangent perpendicular to your radius. So as soon as you see a center, you can say, okay, I've got four theorems that I must check. Do I have a line from center that is either perpendicular to a chord or at the midpoint of a chord? Do I have angle at center? Do I have a diameter? Do I have a tangent? And you can go through and you can see if there's anything that you can see from that. If you don't have the center of the circle, but you have four or more points on the edge, on the circumference, then you can look at these four theorems. You can look for your bow tie, which is your angles in the same segment. You can look for your equal chords, equal angles. You can look for your opposite angles of a cyclic quad. And you can look for your exterior angle of a cyclic quad. Again, four points on the circumference, four theorems. OK, if you have the center, four theorems. If you have points on the circumference, four theorems. The last one, if you have a tangent, three theorems. You either looking for tangent perpendicular to radius or you're looking for tan chord theorem or you're looking for tangents from a common point. Guys. This is gold. Take a photo. I see it's been shared as an image in the chat. This is your cheat sheet of how to tackle the easy circle geometry questions because you can go through the information step by step. Okay, right. It is time for us to practice. So I want you to bear with me. We're just going to pull up this guy quickly. Um, we are now moving into your learner book. We're starting with June 2024. Um, it's your learner book, page 10. And in your workbook, 
page 12. So all the work we're doing, if you ever get lost, on the right hand side of the screen will always tell you what paper we are in, the page number in your learner book, the page number in your workbook, and I'm going to tell you the time. Okay, I'll give you a minute to find it. You don't need a piece of paper. There's enough um, in the answer book for you to fill in everything, but you will definitely need a pen, a pencil. If you have a colored pen or a highlighter, if you can share with each other, it's really, really helpful to have a colored piece of anything. Pencil, crayon, highlighter, cokey, a red pen instead of a black pen, anything that has a different color. One minute to get yourselves organized. Okay, I'm hoping you are ready. Now, you'll see there's a big red bubble in the middle here. It says NBNB, read the whole paragraph before you start. Look for keywords and ask yourself, what do they tell me? So to be honest, right now, I'm not interested in the question. I'm not interested in that at all. I am focusing on this little bit over here, right at the top, because that is where the important information is. Let's read. In the diagram, PQRS is a cyclic quad. Ding, 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 keyword. What does the cyclic quad tell me? Let's carry on reading. With RQ equals to RS. Ding, 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 keyword. What does that tell me? ST is a tangent. Ding, ding, ding. What does that tell me? Straight away, in the first sentence and a half, we have three really important pieces of information. Okay, so let's start with our cyclic quad. PQRS is a cyclic quad. Let's have a look at our picture. P, Q, oh, that's not going to straighten. Let's try that again. P, Q, R, S is a cyclic quad. Okay, let's remember, where's our cheat sheet? Let's go back. Cyclic quad, four points on the circumference. Opposite angles must add up to 180 or exterior angle of a triangle. Okay, let's go back. Let's see what we have. Okay, we don't have any angles inside our cyclic quad, but we do have an exterior angle. Okay, what do I know about my exterior angle? It is the same as my opposite interior angle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop into the cyclic quad and then I'm going to hop across. And I know that this guy is going to be 68 degrees because of exterior angles of a cyclic quad. Brilliant. Okay, let's carry on reading. The next thing they told us was RQ equals RS. Okay, RQ equals RS. That's over here. What does that tell me? Well, that tells me I have an isosceles triangle. What does that tell me? Well, that tells me that these angles are going to be equal. I don't know what they are right now, but I'm going to put a little dot in there to tell me that I remember that they are equal. Okay, let's carry on reading. We know that ST is a tangent. Tangent, let's go back to our cheat sheet. Tangents, do I have tan perpendicular to radius? Do I have tan chord theorem? Do I have two tangents? Let's have a look. Okay, I only have one tangent, so that's not going to know tangents from a common point. I don't have the center of the circle, so there's no tangent perpendicular to radius, but I might have tan chord theorem. Let's see. That angle over there is going to be the same as the angle over there. But hold on, that angle over there is the same as that angle over there. And so I know right from the beginning that all three of those angles are going to be the same. Okay. All right, let's carry on reading. SR is produced to N. That's not giving us anything. And R2 equals 68. They've already showed us that. Okay, look at all that information we have gotten without even reading the question. Okay, so now we can go and we can read the question. And um, <clears throat> I'm missing part one. Yeah, I'm hoping there it is. So the first question they've asked us is find angle P. And that's over there. And then they want us to find Q1 and S1. And we know that Q1, S2, and S1 are all going to be the same 
and we should be able to figure it out. We've got angles in a triangle, we've got angles on a straight line. I think you have enough to give it a go. Okay, this is the strategy that you need to do every time you read a circle geometry question. Spend a minute reading this story up here and asking yourself, what does it tell me? Okay, I'm going to give you seven minutes to give this one a go. You should be done hopefully less than seven minutes, but I'm going to give you the full time anyway to, to kind of warm up, and I will see you in seven minutes. Let's go. Okay, let's have a look. So we've seen uh, some answers in the chat. That's lovely. Let's have a look at how we're going to do it. Okay. So this was from June 2024. So I've given you some answers here, but we're going to talk through it slowly. So I'm hoping, oh, thank you, Ajay. Lovely to see Ajay, sorry. When you tackle a geometry question like this, it's important to use your diagram the way I've been doing it. If you have a colored pencil, an old pencil crayon, a highlighter, draw in all the shapes that you see. It really will help you. Okay, so I'm hoping the first two, nice and easy, P equals 68, reason exterior angles of a cyclic quad. For those of you who didn't see the exterior angle, you might have seen angles on a straight line. If you saw angles on a straight line and you said that R1 is 112 because of angles on a straight line, and then you saw the cyclic quad and you said that P equals 68 because of opposite angles in a cyclic quad, that's absolutely fine. Just remember, if you're going to choose a longer method, you have to have a statement and reason for every single step. Okay, so if you saw that, that this was 112 angles on a straight line, and then you did opposite angles, you would still get full marks as long as you wrote both steps and both reasons. Okay, question 8.2.2 was a little bit sneaky because it's only worth two marks, and so it feels like it's going to be one step, but it's actually not one step. Um, it is two steps because we first know that these two sides are equal, which tells me that these angles are equal. And that is a step that you have to write down on your own first. So you can say Q1 is equal to S2 because of angles opposite equal sides, even if you don't know what that angle is. Then the quickest way to get to the 34 is to look at the exterior angle of a triangle. Now remember your exterior angle of a triangle rule says if I have a triangle that has an exterior angle, then this guy plus this guy will give me the exterior angle. So we know that our outside angle here, let me draw it in here so you can see it. Uh, let's hope that straightens. So there is, um, let's draw my triangle a bit better. There's my triangle, there's my exterior angle. So this angle plus this angle must give me 68. And I know that, um, those two angles are equal. So I'm going to take my 68 and divide it in two. So that is the quickest way to do it. And you would get one mark for statement and reason and one mark here for statement and reason. Now, again, you might not have seen that. That's okay. You might have seen angles on a straight line and then the isosceles triangle, in which case you could have gotten that said that Q1 equals S2, angles opposite equal sides. R1 is 112, angles on a straight line. And so Q1 equals 34, interior angles of a triangle. But please, please, please be careful. Often, you guys jump straight to this. You will say Q1 equals 34. And your reason will be angles opposite equal sides. That is not correct. Angles opposite equal sides tells me that the angles are equal. It doesn't tell me why it's 34. It's 34 because of angles sum in triangle. 
okay? Because we know that the interior angles of a triangle must add up to 180. So every time you have an isosceles triangle, you've got to think two steps. Isosceles triangle, two steps. Isosceles triangle, two steps. First, that the angles are equal. Second, the size of the angle because of angles in a triangle. Okay, so I'm hoping you got Q1 equals 34. Remember, you cannot use for your reason RS equals RQ. That is not a reason that we use. The correct reason is angles opposite equal sides. Okay. Hola. Yes. Thank you. That was one of the questions of Jochen Meiring about RS equals um, or what RS and RQ. So we would rather stick, like you said, to the reason uh, angles opposite equal sides. And then some, I just want to so, so, thank you so much for the answers. Yo, I couldn't keep up uh, writing down the names. But um, uh, I have seen um, some learners will say, um, oh, like you said now, but I just want to say oh, angles opposite equal sides without saying it's the interior angles of a triangle. That's the one thing I saw. And then I saw them using X, which is nice. But if you use an X in the exam, you must tell the examiner, let S2 equals X. Then you can say X plus X is 112. But you can't just use X plus X is 112 without us knowing where your X is if it's not given. But great answers. Great answers. Thank you so much for the participation. Okay, so there's one more comment I just want to make about this isosceles triangle. I know we're doing it slowly now, guys, but this is really, really important. Um, so what, and this is why it's so important for us that you send us some of your answers so that we can pick up some common mistakes to make sure that you guys don't do it in the exam. Another one that you guys often do is you'll jump straight to Q1 equals 34 degrees because you've seen that it's angles opposite equal sides. And you've seen that it's interior angles of a triangle or angle sum in triangle. And you'll put two reasons next to each other. Okay, please don't do this. Um, it makes it very difficult for the markers to mark. The memorandum is very, very strict. And we don't want to, to um, get into a situation where there's any sort of gray area. So some teachers have taught you that you can put two reasons next to each other in one line. We really don't want to see that in your final exam. Remember, your goal is to make your exam paper as easy to mark as possible. So isosceles triangles always have two steps, one about equal sides, um, angles opposite equal sides, and the second line about angle sum and triangle. Okay. Right. Well, the I last mistake, sorry, that I picked up is they say S1 is 34, and then the reason is converse tan four here. Yes, right. Let's talk about that guy. Thank you. Okay, so the last one is to find S1. So 8.2.3, S1 equals 34. I'm hoping from here that you all see it's tan chord theorem. So you say, right, this guy's 34, so tan chord will make this guy 34. But when you learnt the theorem, you learnt it as starting with this angle between the tangent and the chord and then hopping into the triangle. And so your brain tells you that when you go backwards that it's going to be converse, but it's actually not the converse theorem. So remember this tan chord theorem says, if I have a tangent, then the angle between the tangent and the chord will equal the angle in the triangle. So I'm summarizing. So remember, whether you're going from the tangent angle over here into the triangle, or whether you're going from the triangle back to the angle between the tangent and the chord, the reason is the same. The only time we're going to use converse tan chord theorem is when we're trying to prove that ST is a tangent. Okay, so this question was really good to kind of double check all the basics. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to uh, November 2023. So November 2023, it's in page 20 in your learner book, page 23 in your answer book, in your workbook. And I want you to try and again, look at the question, focus on this top part here. 
And I'm going to give you a minute to read it and see what information you can get out of the question before we start the timer. Okay, so remember you're looking for key words. What are the key words? What do they tell me? And what, what can I use with that? Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Get your um, pages ready and start reading the question to see what information have I got? Okay, so let's read it quickly and then I'm going to start the timer. They've told us that O is the center of the circle. So again, what does that mean? If you go back all the way to that cheat sheet, center of the circle, let's have a look. I have four possible theorems that I can look for. Line from center, angle at center, angles in a semicircle and tan chord. Okay, so let's have a look. I've got a center of a circle here. I've got radii. Radii also tells me something, and I'm hoping you see angle at center over there. So let's draw in the radii, and we know that whatever this guy is, this guy is going to be half, so we've got a relationship there. We also know about um, ABCD as a cyclic quad. Okay, I just want to change the colors quickly so that they match um, what we're doing. So let's make this guy green because that's the center of our circle. And here's our cyclic quad, so let's draw in our cyclic quad. Okay, cyclic quad, we've got two theorems, the opposite angles add up to 180, or the exterior angle, we've got no exterior angle, so we're definitely looking at opposite angles of a cyclic quad. Okay, let's read what else we know. They've told me O1 is 4x plus 100, and they've told me that angle C, which is down here, is x plus 34. Okay, now I'm going to give you not the full six minutes, I'm going to give you three minutes to start the question. And then I'm going to uh, interrupt to check that you guys are all on the right track. Okay, so three minutes, we're gonna start, see what you can do with that, and then we'll talk about it and I'll give you an opportunity to finish it off. Okay, so let's have a look now. Matrix, um, have a look at the at the screen. This is a typical question which you can answer in easily three or four different ways. So the trick is to make sure that every step that you are using, you have a statement and the reason that goes with it. The great news about Euclidean geometry in Matrix is that the marker marks your story whichever method that you use. So if you go the longest way around, we will read every single line and check that you know what you are doing. Okay, so this question is a very nice question because they have put in a lot of tricks. So the first trick that they're wanting you to do is they want you to think that DOBC is a cyclic quad. And remember I told you right at the beginning, you've got to be careful that cyclic quads must have all four points on the circumference. So DOBC is not cyclic, okay? That is a typical question. They're trying to trick you. Don't fall for it, okay? So these two do not equal 180 when you add them together, okay? So for those of you who might have gone down that route, 
That's okay. We're learning today so that we don't make that mistake in the final exam. So we're going to start and have another look. We have angle at center. So there's my angle at the center. It is 4x plus 100, which means this angle at the circumference has to be half of that number. Now, you want to panic because it's not a number. We're not going to panic. Half of 4x is 2x, and half of 100 is 50. So if you go that way, you can start by saying angle A is going to be 2x plus 50 because of angle at center. Okay. Now, remember that is a very long reason, so you want to write all of it. Now that we have our cyclic quad in blue, we can say, okay, what do we know about cyclic quads? We know that opposite angles must add up to 180. So we know that angle A plus angle C must give me 180 because of opposite angles of a cyclic quad. Well, I can't spell. And, and so we can do the little maths from there. Okay, we'll end up with 2x plus 50 plus x plus 34 to give me 180. And so we go on, we land up with x equals 32 degrees. Okay, so let's just have a look here. I've actually got that answer typed up nicely. So we've started this way and we've said there's your angle at cent equals two times angle circumference and then opposite angles of a cyclic quad. Now this was five marks. It's very mark heavy. It is your bank marks. So you'll notice there's one mark for getting the 2x plus 50, one mark for your reason, one mark for um, putting the statement together of opposite angles in a cyclic quad, one mark for your reason, and one mark for getting the 32. Now that's just one way. Some of you might have gone a different route and you might have remembered this trick, okay? That if I have this shape, that this guy in the middle is not a cyclic quad, but actually it's angle at center upside down. So if you did that, then what you could have done is you could have done this bottom option here where you've said, well, this is X plus 34, which means angle at center is going to double that X plus 34 and become 2X plus 68. In which case that step would have got you your first tick because of angle at center. And then you could have used angles around a point or angles in a revolution. And again, one mark for statement, one mark for reason, one mark for the answer. Okay, and there are many other ways that you could have done it. Some of you might have said that O2 is 360 minus 4x plus 100 and worked with that. It doesn't matter. Whichever method you do, that's how we do it. Okay, so for those of you who might have seen um, or made the mistake of um, thinking it's a cyclic quad in the middle here, get out a red pen, get out a highlighter, borrow, borrow a highlighter from a guy next door to you, and just make a note so that you don't make that same mistake in the next question. Okay, so that was 8.2. Yes. Yeah, I have a question, yeah. Um, but first I want to say uh, thank you again for all the answers. Um, the thing that I picked up, uh, they they did it quite nicely, I must say. I'm just very like impressed. It. Yeah, the thing that I picked up, some learners said 2x plus 50 there in A, but they didn't write it out as part of the, you know, the, the answer. And so the, that reason for angle at the center, that's missing. So um, if you can just say if they write something on the sketch, they must write it out. That's the one thing. And then um, someone also, I just want to give a name. Uh, Izile Gwe asked, man, I didn't quite catch step two. Can you please explain again? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, right. Um, what, Mrs. Reed said, what Mrs. Reed said? Mrs. Reed, can you mute? Otherwise, there's an echo. Okay. So, it's, it's catch 22, guys. I really, really, really want you to use the diagram, okay? So in other words, draw everything onto your picture. But like Mrs. Reed said, you have to make sure that if you are going to put it on your picture, that you write it down as well. So you'll notice there's my 2x plus 50, there's my statement 2x plus 50. 
Now, the good news is if you have no clue what you're doing, but you still do it on your picture, then the marker will hopefully see it on your picture and give you that mark there. But the worst thing that can happen is that you do know what you're doing and you lose the mark because you don't write it down. So make sure that everything on your picture is also written down. Okay, Isile, uh, I'm not sure if it's the first method or the second method. I'm assuming that it's the second option here. Um, if you can let me know, then I'll know what I can explain for you to you again. Okay. Yeah, maybe Paula, if they have questions, I, I can read in the chat and I'm following the chat all the time, but I can miss it because they are they are chatting with me now. And um, so if you want to ask a question, feel free to ask your teacher to put up your hand and then ask uh, Paula directly. Okay, I'm going to wait for that and move on from there. See, see, I see it now, man. Thank you. See, she, she hasn't got the question anymore. She see it now. Perfect. So, okay, let's keep moving. Okay, so we've done uh, two questions now, and I'm hoping you're seeing that there's a bit of a pattern. Um, so now let's jump on to question 8.3. We're still in November 2023. We're doing question 8.3. Um, again, keywords. I'm going to now, I feel like you guys have got a good grasp of what you're doing. Um, so I want to give you two minutes, three minutes to try this one. Read from the beginning, see what you can figure out. And then in five minutes time, I'll help you because this one is using our line from center theorem, which is a theorem we haven't spoken about much today. Well, after this question, can you give Reese Edmund uh, a, a chance? He's, he's referring back to right to our first question that he didn't understand something. But after Perfect. we've discussed this.
Here we go. Okay. okay. So this question is actually turning out into be a very good question. Okay. So going back to 8.3.1, a lot of you saw the 90. And so you wrote OMB equals 90 and you got your one mark, which is great. But when you look at this picture initially, if you don't highlight and use your keywords and you just look at this picture without the highlighted bits, then it looks like that OM is perpendicular to AB because it is. But what is the reason why it's 90? So let's just remind ourselves quickly about this theorem. And it's a theorem that I didn't chat about too much at the start. And it's the line from center theorem. It says, if I have a chord and I have a line from the center that cuts the chord in half. So if I have this, Okay, let's give ourselves some letters here. Let's call this A, B, and let's call this M, and let's call the center of our circle O. If I know that A, M is equal to M, B, then I know that O, M, B is going to be 90. Okay, so this is our line from center theorem, and this is the version which tells us that we have a line from center to a midpoint. OK, so we have the line from center to the midpoint of a chord. Now, if I go back to the question that I have here and I just get rid of that highlighting quickly, have they told me that I have a line from center that goes to a midpoint? They haven't. I haven't got anything that tells me that AM is equal to MB. So I can't use this theorem. And then you might be thinking, but hold on, there's another theorem that looks very similar. Yes, there is. Let me show you that one. The other theorem that talks about line from center is very similar. It says, if I have a line from center, let's draw it in quickly. And I have a chord. And the chord buys, uh, cuts at 90. Then I know that they're equal. So again, here's my A, my B my M and my O, if OM is perpendicular to AB, then I know that AM is going to be MB. That reason is very similar. It's line from center. It still starts the same, but now it says line from center perpendicular to chord. Okay, now again, what do I need for this version? I need the 90. Okay, so let me go back to my picture. Do I have a 90 here? Have they told me that there's a 90 anywhere? No, they haven't. So we've got to be very careful. It is 90, but it's not because of line from center at all. The reason we have a 90 is because that OB is the diameter. And we know that as soon as we have a diameter, then we have angles in a semicircle. And so that is why angle M is 90. OK, so they're being sneaky there. You've got to be careful. Right. Um, now, that we... yes, sorry. So um, I just have an answer here in the chat. Now, where the learner said nicely, the M is 90 angles in a semicircle. And then she said AM is equal to MB, right, which is right. Then the reason was line from the center to the center. So. And I think they're still confused. Well, let me just read. She said, uh, line from center to midpoint. Yeah. So, but she's using the midpoint. Now she's giving it as a reason. We need most the 90 degree in the reason. If we, yeah. We can just share that again. Okay. So let's have a look at 8.3.2 because it sounds like you guys are all on the right track. And I'm so impressed. I really am so impressed, but we've got to make sure that we don't get caught with the sneaky, sneaky things about these reasons. OK, so from point part one, we know that we have a 90 degrees over here. And so now we know that if I have a 90 degrees, that 
AM is equal to MB. And I think you guys are all happy with that. We know that AM is going to be MB, and it's going to be half of the square root of 300, which is 5 root 3. So that's not the problem. You guys, are, I think you're all happy with that. The problem comes in with what reason we use. Now, you need to study this piece of wisdom because it took me a long time to remember it as well. Don't worry, you are, you are all, and we're all in the same boat here. The reason is what you have. Okay, so when I'm looking at my picture here, I am stating that MB is half of AM, but why can I say that? I can say that because I know that I have the 90. Okay, so that is my reason. My reason is because I have a line from center that is perpendicular to the chord. Okay, so if we go back, let me just give you a, sentence, a second to think about that. I'm gonna say it again. When I'm trying to decide which of the two reasons to use, I'm going to look at my picture and I'm going to say, well, what have I got? What do I know? What was it given to me? The 90 degrees. What can I deduce from that? What did I learn from that, that the lines are equal? So this reason here is from what was given, what you knew, not from what you've decided because of what you knew. That was terrible English. Third time. Your reason? is what you have. You have the 90, so it's line from center perpendicular to chord. What does that tell me? That the chord is cut in half. Okay, Paula, two more questions. The one question is, instead of saying angle in a semicircle, can I just say diameter OB? Again? I No. <laughs> Let's just, <laughs> please don't. It's so tempting because diameter is your keyword, but the diameter is the keyword to remind you of angles in a semicircle. Use the reasons that they have on the guidelines document to make absolutely sure that you get all the marks. So be careful, it's not because of the diameter. The correct reason is angles in a semicircle. Then the last question. Is it wrong to say M is 90 and use the following reason? Tan perpendicular to radius. Very, very good question. Okay, so let's have a look quickly and see if we have a tangent perpendicular to radius. And just for those of you watching, your tan perpendicular to radius theorem says that if I have a tangent and I have a radius, that it will cut at 90. So I know that's a very small picture up here. So now I'm wanting to look at this 90 and I want to see, do I have a radius and a tangent? Now you've got to be careful and look at which circle you're looking at. So my radius is in the bigger circle. Okay, so there it is. It's, it's kind of a line from center. It's not quite a radius because it doesn't go all the way to the end. So there's my radius. But AM is not a tangent, unfortunately. It's a chord. If it was a tangent, it would be down here. Then it would be radius perpendicular to tangent. But AB is not a tangent. It is actually just a chord. But again, very good question because it's an easy, easy mistake to have. Okay, it's an mist easy mistake to see. So get out your red pen and make a note so you don't make the same mistake twice. Okay, right. Thank you very much. I think that was a really good question. We're going to do the last question of this, and then we're going to um, tackle the next section. So this one, I'm going to give you the full time, seven minutes. I'm not reading it to you. You're on your own. Let's see how many marks out of seven you're going to get. You've got seven minutes. Your time starts now. Right. Fantastic matrix. I hope that we are going to feel strong and confident after doing this question. Um, I've given you the full seven minutes. Um, I'm so impressed with the answers coming through from the chat. And um, I've had some pics of you guys in the classroom. And I really want to say I'm so impressed with your commitment. I know it's a long Friday. And um, sure, you guys are going above and beyond. So I will.
I'm just really, really impressed. OK, let's have a look at this guy. We're going to look at our keywords, see what they tell us and see if we can get six out of six marks in the bank. First thing, O is the center of the circle. So remember, if I have the center of the circle, I must think of radii and I must think angle at center equals two times angle at circumference. And I'm hoping you spot that quite easily. OK, the next key word, MNPR is a cyclic quad, M, N, P, R. I grab another cokey or a highlighter or a pen, a red pen, black pen, anything, and I circle my cyclic quad. Straight away, I see that if that guy's 64, then I can find my opposite angle because it's going to be 180 minus 64. And then from there, I can also find my angle at center, which is going to be 128 because its angle at center is two times the angle at the circumference. OK, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that I found just from those two words. Right. Lastly, SN is a diameter. We're loving this diameter. What do we think straight away? Angles in a semicircle. So now we have a 90 as well. And I'm not even reading the question yet. I'm just looking at my keywords. So if I've got 64, that means I can find S1 because I know it must add up to 90. And they've told me that M2 is 64. So let's have a look at how we actually answer the questions. OK, so from here, if I want to find angle P, it is opposite angles of a cyclic quad. So this is going to be 116 degrees opposite angles of a cyclic quad, one mark for statement, one mark for reason. Next question, they wanted us to find M1, which is this angle over there. And I know that this comes from my diameter. I know angles in a semicircle add up to 90. And so M1 plus M2 must give me 90. And so M1 is going to be 26 because of angles in a semicircle. Then the last question, they want us to find O1. Now we know from the radii that we can find the angle at center. And so we can find angle at center. And because of the way this picture is drawn, you might see the angle at center O2 before you see O1. So you could have used the 64 and you could have gotten to the 128. And then you could have said angles on a straight line and you would have got the 52. OK, so that would have been two steps, which is absolutely fine. However, there is a quicker way to do it. And this is where it's so important that you put your information on your picture. Because if I go back to 812 and I put in this 26 on my picture, then you might be able to see that you've got an angle at the center over here and an angle at the circumference over there. It's a little bit harder to see because it's not as easy. So if this M1 is 26, then O1 is going to be 52. And that's the quickest way to get to O1 as angle at center. But for many of you, you might not have seen that. And so you would have gone a different way and you would have said O2 is 128 because of angle at center from M2. And then let's just finish writing this. And then you would have said, therefore, O1 is 52 degrees angles on a straight line. OK, and just remember, if you do go the longer way, that's absolutely fine. You just need to make sure that you have both steps and both reasons. OK, because that's how you're going to get all your marks. OK, um, I'll give you a minute. Are there any questions about this guy? This guy? Paula, I must say the answers that's coming in looks perfect and they are using color crayons to to figure out what's going on. They're doing very well. Right, guys, I know you've been going at this for a while now. I'm going to ask you to dig deep. We are going to go back and we're going to look at the next part of the geometry. I know I've given you a break. I'm going to give you a five or six minute break 
at half past one. I promise no matter where we're at, we're going to have a break. But let's just dig a bit deeper. Let's go back to this guy. Okay, so what we've been doing since 11 o'clock is we've been talking about understanding our theorems and making sure we memorize the basics. But now we actually need to start looking at the harder questions, which is when they ask us, how do we prove that lines are parallel, um, for example, or how do we prove a tangent? So I'm going to focus on three. The first one is, how do I prove that two lines are parallel? Now, as soon as you think parallel lines, I want you to think corresponding co-interior alternate. OK, this is study work. Parallel lines, fuzz, corresponding co-interior alternate. If they want you to prove that a line is a tangent, then you're going to start thinking tan chord theorem. And the third one that they love asking is they want you to prove that a normal quad is a cyclic quad. OK, so when you think of that, you've got to start thinking opposite angles of a cyclic quad or exterior angles of a cyclic quad. There is a third option, which is angles in the same segment. So I'm talking about the shape that you're looking for there, the shape. You're looking for opposite angle supplementary or exterior angle equals opposite angle or your bow tie shape. OK, so let's carry on. The important thing I want you to remember is that you always need to link the things that make the line parallel, the angles that make the tan chord, the angles that make your cyclic chord. We're going to talk about the link and then this little gem. There is a golden rule in geometry that is really, really helpful. If you are working in geometry and you can prove that A is the same as B, and it doesn't matter what A is. It could be an angle. It could be a side. But if you can prove that A is the same as B, but you can also prove that B is the same as C, then you can safely assume that A will also be C. If A equals B and B equals C, well, that just means you can cut out the middleman. Cut out the middleman, and you can therefore say that A will be the same as C. And this principle we use very often in geometry. OK, so and we use it in the grade 12 similarity as well very often. OK, so now what do I mean about converse thinking? Well, I'm going to give you a quad. There's a quad on the screen. We have angle B at the top, which is X. We have angle D at the bottom, which is 180 minus X. I don't know what X is, but I can see that if I add those two together, I am going to get 180 degrees. OK, which means that A, B, C, D could be a cyclic quad which means I could draw a circle around those four points. Now, how do we lay out our answer? This is the important thing. You can say, because B plus D is literally X plus 180 minus X, we will get 180. And so A, B, C, D is a cyclic quad. But our reason is converse opposite angles of a cyclic quad. Remember? The cyclic quad theorem says, if I have a cyclic quad, then opposite angles are supplementary. We're now doing it backwards. We're saying we have a normal quad, no circle, but the opposite angles do add up to 180. And so we're using the converse reason. Once I've proven that opposite angles are supplementary, I can say it must be a cyclic quad, which means I could draw a circle around those points. OK, let's have a look at this one. If I have a quadrilateral with an exterior angle, the question is, can I draw a circle around A, B, C, D? And I have a look and I say, well, hang on. That guy's X. The outside angle is also X. They're the same, which means that is enough. So I can say B will equal D, C, E. Reason, given or proven, whatever I've done. Therefore, A, B, C, D is a cyclic quad converse exterior angle of a cyclic quad. They are very, very, very strict. If you are proving a cyclic quad, you have to have converse and cyclic quad in your reason here. 
If you just write exterior angle of a cyclic quad, you'll get it wrong. If you say converse exterior angle of a quad, you will also get it wrong. It has to be converse exterior angle of a cyclic quad. What does it mean? It means that now I can draw a circle around those four points. This guy over here is what we call the link. It is the final step that joins the two angles that I need. So if I'm proving exterior angle of a cyclic quad equals opposite interior angle, that means I need to link the exterior angle with the opposite interior angle. That is my link. Okay, tangents, let's have a, oh, this is the last one for a cyclic quad. Sorry. Yes. I know it's my picture there. Just go back. I think we've got the X in the wrong space. Just go back to the previous and, picture. And, I mean, give me a second. I know it's my mistake. I know, but I just realized. Mustn't it that X be oh, at right. A? No, it must be oh. at A. Can you see? Yes. That X must be you at are a. absolutely correct. Let's move it quickly. <laughs> Sorry, it's my mistake. Sorry. Oh, I missed that one. Let's move him quickly. Let's move him. Let's move him. He must go there. Well spotted. Okay, let's get rid of that. Let's try that again. Oh, that's much better. Hop into the quad and up across. Thank you so much. Okay, that's much better. So you can prove. So let's, let's make that an A. You'll see all this work Sorry. behind the scene, guys. Okay. So A plus DC equals X. There we go. That's much better. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I missed that. Right. Let's have a look at this one. If I have no cyclic quads, so I just have a bow tie, but I can prove that the top angles are the same or the bottom angles being the same, then I can prove that it is a cyclic quad. Now, you might have to do a whole bunch of manipulation to get to this point, but now you've got the X's in the right place and we want to do our final line. We want to write the link. The link is B will equal C and they both equal X, which means that A, B, C, D is a cyclic quad. What would my reason here be? It is converse angles in the same segment because we're using the theorem backwards. We haven't got a circle, but now we can prove that we can draw in a circle. Okay, those are the three ways to prove your cyclic quad. The next question they love to ask is they love to ask us to prove a tangent. So let's have a look here. I do not have a circle, but I'm trying to prove that DB is a tangent to a circle that goes through A, B, and C. Okay, so I have a look. I've got an angle between the line, which I'm hoping is a tangent, and the chord AB. And it is the same as angle C. Now, if I had to draw in a circle, would that be tan chord theorem? Yes. But how do I write it down? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say ABD is the same as C, and it is X, given, proven, whatever you've done to get there. Therefore, BD is a tangent, and your reason is converse tan chord theorem. Okay, now you can draw a circle around those three points. Right, five minutes. I think I'm going to give you a five minute break now. I want you all back seated at, half, at um, half past two. We're going to do a little five minute break just so you can go to the toilet, and then we will practice some more. I want to show you what we're practicing for those of you who want to get started or perhaps don't want to go to the bathroom. We're going to be starting with June 2024. This is quite a long one, but I'll do it in five minutes time. Okay, quick little break. Brain break. Lovely, thank you. Um, so they're wanting us to find three other angles equal to D1, four marks. They want us to prove that DG equals GC, also four marks. And then they want us to find the length of BG. Okay, so this one is a little bit tougher because it's not easy statement, reason, statement, reason. But you guys know your stuff. You've shown me that you know your stuff. And so you can give this a go. It is 12 marks. So in an exam, you would have 14 minutes. We're going to split it up a little bit. I'm going to give you um, about 10 minutes. 
to start and do 9.1 and 9.2. And then we'll mark and check that you're on the right track because this is another question where you've got your line from center. And so it's easy to get confused with your reasoning. So I wanna make sure that we get 9.2 correct before we tackle with 9.3. So let's go 10 minutes and then we will start working. Remember your keywords. I see the word diameter. I see a new one here. Let, let me just highlight this before you start. Um, this word here, BA bisects CAD. That's a new one. So we've got our AB is a diameter. We've got BA bisects. What does bisect mean? It means cut in half. So bisect means cut in half. So BA cuts CAD in half. So those two angles are equal to each other. Okay, I will give you your 10 minutes and stop talking. Okay, so this one, you can see a step up. So we definitely need to keep our wits about us and we need to go slowly and surely through our theorems. Okay, so um, thanks to those of you who've been posting on the chat. This one is a little bit more interesting because there's, when you look at this picture, your gut kind of says, well, it looks like it wants to be a kite, kind of like if I just had to draw that in, then it would be a kite, surely. And so we've, that's 90, surely. Be careful, Matrix. Please be very, very careful. You cannot assume anything in this picture. It looks like G1 and 2 are 90. It looks like db is parallel to fc and so you might be tempted to use alternate angles or 90 degrees that actually aren't there you have to go through the story and you have to ask yourself what have they definitely told me so let's go through it again they have told me that ab is a diameter so as soon as i have a diameter i draw in my 90 degrees Okay, so that's what I know from AB as a diameter. They have told me that I have center F. So if F is a center, that means I have radii. So I've drawn in little um, lines to remind me that FC is going to be the same as FA, which is going to be the same as DF, because that tells me that I'm going to have a whole bunch of isosceles triangles there. Okay. So I've drawn little dots. So that dot will be that dot. This dot will be that dot. And they've also told me that BA bisects CAD, which is why I know that these two dots are going to be the same. So this dot is the same as that one because it's bisected. And those are going to be the same because they're isosceles triangles. And all of that I know before I even read the first question 9.1. Okay, so now I go 9.1, determine with reasons, three other angles equal to D1. So I have a look at this, that 90 is not giving me much help at the moment. Neither are my radii because I don't know what these are. But maybe there's something that I'm missing. And I ask myself, do I have four points on the circumference? I do. And when I have four points on the circumference, what do I know? I go back to my cheat sheet, four points on the circumference. I can look for bow tie. I can look for equal chords, equal angles, and I can look for cyclic quads. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to start by looking for a bow tie. So let's see, can we see a bow tie here? And yes, there is a bow tie. Okay, so I've got angles in the same segment. Okay, so looking at angles in the same segment, I know that D1 is going to be A2 because of angles in the same segment. Right, I see some questions coming through on the chat. I will answer those questions in a minute. Okay, so once I have this guy A2 to be 37 degrees, I want you to put it into your picture because that's going to help you remember that A1 is also 37 degrees. Why? because they told me that AB bisects this angle. Right, and then from there, you've actually got some choices. You can go to D3 and say D3 is 37 because of angles opposite equal radii, 
Or you can even say F2 equals 37 because of angles opposite equal radii. Either one of those will work and you will get three other angles equal to 37. OK, so um, that mark allocation is four marks and you might be wondering how does that work? Well, this is from June 2024, so I don't have the official memo, but what often happens is when you get reasons that are given or grade eight or nine reasons, then they might allocate one mark for both. So if I was going to mark this, I would do it somewhere along the lines of this. So there's your statement mark. There's your reason mark. This would be one mark for the statement and the reason. If you're lucky, just for the statement. And this one also statement and reason. For these tougher questions, it's often that you will have to have the correct statement and the correct reason to give you the mark, at least in the beginning. OK, now what are some of the common mistakes that we make in a question like this? Well, like I said, some of you would assume that that is a 90. So you've got to be careful there. We can't assume we don't know. Another thing that you might um, see or think is that this guy's going to be 37 because of alternate angles. OK, it's very, very easy to make that mistake, but be careful. They haven't told you parallel lines, so you can't do that. There are no parallel lines. OK, so those are just two common errors that they often see there. Now, they want well, us in nine. Yes. Office, there's another uh, question here, um, and I think it's also a common error. D1 equal to F2 angles on the same segment. OK, another very common mistake. So let me show you quickly. So remember I told you right at the beginning, you've got to be careful. They see this bow tie and they think angles in the same segment, that these two angles are going to be the same. Be careful, be careful, be careful. What is the rule for your bow tie? For your bow tie, all four points have to be on the circumference. So D's on the circumference, B's on the circumference, C's on the circumference, but F is in the middle. So for your bow tie, all of them must be on the edge of the circle. Guys, it's a very, very common mistake. So get out your highlighter, get out your red pen, make sure you don't fall into that trap in the final exam. Okay, so first four marks, I'm hoping you got, um, you got a lot of those. Now we move on to question 9.2 and it says show that DG equals GC. Now, <clears throat> I've put the answers in here, but if you're looking at this, there's a few things that could pop into your head. So some of you might assume that that's 90 because it looks like it's 90. And then you will use line from center perpendicular to chord. OK, unfortunately, you cannot assume that G1 and G2 is 90. Okay. The other thing that you guys might want to do is you want to prove congruency. So you look in this triangle over here and you look in this triangle over here and you say, but hang on, I've got a common side in the middle. I've got radii and I know that this guy must be the same as this guy because it's an isosceles triangle. And so I've got enough to prove congruency. Guys, be careful, be careful. Don't fall into the trap. For congruency, it's either side, 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 angle, side, angle, angle, side, or RHS. And if you're trying to prove congruency here, you've got a side, you've got a side, and you've got an angle, but the angle is not in the middle. The angle has to be in the middle to be able to prove congruency. So unfortunately, you've got to be very careful in this question. It was quite a tricky sum for you to, to, to work through and not fall into the traps that they want you to fall into. OK, so be careful. It's not congruency. We haven't got enough for congruency. Um, we also can't assume that that is 90. Right, so let's ask ourselves, what do we know? OK, we know that this guy's 37. We know that this guy's 37. 
And we know that that has to be 90 because we haven't used the diameter yet. So if that whole angle is 90, that means I can figure out what this one is. So let's do that. I'm going to start by finding D2. It is 90 minus 37 minus another 37. It gives me 16 degrees. Reason? Angles in a semicircle. Okay. So from here, I can play a little bit more because I now have a big triangle, which you might not see easily, but let's have a look at this big triangle here. Okay, it's not gonna, not the neatest drawing, but there we go. There's a big triangle here. In the big triangle, I have 53 and 37, okay? If I do angles in a triangle here, I'm going to get my 90 degrees, but it's going to be because of angles in a triangle. Right. I have now proven that I've got a 90 degrees, but I've legitimately proven my 90. Okay, so let's write that down. D2 equals 16 angles in a semicircle, and G1 is 90 because of interior angles of triangle DGA. I've labeled the triangles because this is quite a busy picture. Now, I can actually use my line from center theorem. I have a legitimate 90, which means DG has to be the same as GC. What's my reason? I always start line from center, and then I ask myself, what is the information that I had? I had the 90, so it's line from center perpendicular to chord. Okay, so that's the answer for 9.1 and 9.2. Let's have a look at the chat and see some of the questions coming through there. Um, Ma'am? There's a question. They say, if I, am I wrong if I say C2 is equal to A2, angles opposite equal radii, therefore C2 is equal to 37? That's that is... That is perfectly correct. I think the question is, how is it going to help you to get closer to answering the question? Okay, so that is correct. You can use that. Uh, C2 equals A2, angles of sequence. Therefore, C2 equals 37. Beautiful. But we still need to get closer to proving that DG equals GC. Okay. Right, now the last question, I'm going to do this one with you. The last question was really, really tough. Sorry, my on. Yeah. Okay, so it was really, really tough. Let's read through it quickly. It says, if it is further given that the radius of the circle is 20 units. So the radius is 20. There's my radii, I've got a few of them. 20 units. Calculate the length of BG. Okay, so what do we have so far? In my little triangle over here, I have a 20. This side's also a 20. And I have a radius down the middle. This one's quite tough to see. I've got a radius down the middle here, which is also going to be 20. But they're only wanting me to find a little part of it, this part over here. Okay, so if the whole thing is 20, can I figure out what FG is going to be? Are they busy making a noise outside my window? Okay, so how can we tackle this? If anyone has tried this, maybe in practicing a past paper, um, Mrs. Reed, can I ask you to mute just because I think there's a bit of an echo. If any of you have tried this in a past paper, there are literally tons of ways to try answer this question. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the ways we can look at um, solving it. This question is really good because you can start bringing in different topics. You can bring in trigonometry. You can bring in all other kinds of geometry that you know. 
So I had a look here and I said, well, I would love to be able to use Pythagoras, but I wasn't sure if I had enough. So in this triangle, I had 20 over here. I had 20 over here. I know this whole thing is 20, but I'm going to let this bit be X. And I want to use Pythagoras, but I don't have enough. I'm just going to draw the triangle again. I literally don't have enough. I've got the 20 over here. I've got my X, but I don't know what that guy is. I can't use Pythagoras. And you want to panic. But remember, what did I say right at the beginning? We're not going to panic. We're going to say, hang on. I know that this is 16 degrees. OK, I also know that if that's 16 degrees, I can find this guy to be 74 degrees. So using my 16, I could say opposite over hypotenuse. And I could say, well, sine of 16 is opposite over hypotenuse. Or if you got the 74 over here, you could say cos of 74 is adjacent over hypotenuse. And so you can sneaky, sneaky bring in some trig. And that's very, very cool. Um, for any of you who are panicking because now there's trigonometry involved, guys, don't worry. Remember, this is the last four marks of 12. You've already got four, six, seven marks in the bag. Your job is done for this question. Tackling 9.3 is just the, the cool bit at the end for if you have time. So don't panic if you don't get this question. But let's have a look at it and see if maybe next time when you're stuck, you can think, how can I bring in a little bit of trigonometry to help me in my geometry? OK, so in blue, I've used F1 equals 74 because of angles in a triangle or exterior angles of a triangle, whichever you prefer. And then I said cos of 74 and I said this little bit here, Fg is x. And I got my x to be 5,51. But that wasn't answering the question. The question is asking for Bg. And Bg is going to be the whole radius, which is 20, minus the 5,51 that I got in this little triangle. For those of you who maybe used the 16 and you thought, OK, well, I've got opposite over hypotenuse, I can still solve for x this way. It's going to be 20 times sine of 16. I'm still going to get 5,51. And so I can still say, OK, BG is going to be the whole radius 20 minus 5,51, and I'll get the same answer. OK, so this guy was a toughie. It was a toughie. It was a hard one, but it's OK because we can do hard things. All right, we're going to do one more question like this, and then we're going to start tackling our grade 12 geometry. So we are skipping now. We're skipping over 2023. I want you to jump to page 33 in your learner book, and uh, it's page 36 in your workbook. And we're looking at this question. I'm going to talk through it with you and then give you uh, just under 10 minutes to try it on your own. A minute to find it. While the rest of you are working through and finding um, November 2022 question nine, I just want to go over 9.2 again. So remember in 9.2, they wanting you to show that DG is equal to GC. That's what they're wanting us to show. And the easiest way to show that is to use our line from center theorem. So if I can somehow get G1 or G2 to be a 90, then I can use my line from center theorem to prove that these two lines are equal. So here, you need to find a strategy. Now, this picture is getting very, very busy all of a sudden. Let's see if I can make it a bit simpler. We know that we had the 37 and the 37 from 9.1. We also know that AB is a diameter, which makes this whole angle over here 90. So I can find this little angle over here, which is 16. So I found D2 to be 16 because of angles in a semicircle. 
And then I looked at this red triangle here. I don't know if you can see it so good. We've got D2 and D3, which is 16 and 37. And I've got this 37 down here, which means if I do angles inside a triangle, I can find G1 and it will be 90 degrees. Okay, so it'll be 180 minus 37 minus 16 minus 37, which will give me the 90. And now I have that golden piece of information and I can say DG will equal GC because the line from center is perpendicular to the chord. Okay, I hope that helps. Great. Okay. So we're looking at one more tough question. The reason I've included this one is they're wanting us to prove that it's a cyclic quad. And remember to prove cyclic quad, we're either looking for a bow tie or we are looking for, oh, that was a terrible bow tie. We're looking for a bow tie or we're looking for opposite angles to be supplementary or we're looking for exterior angle to be opposite interior angle. Okay, so those are the three things that we're trying to find to prove that we have a cyclic quad. Let's read the question. In the diagram, E, B, F, S, and P are points on the circle centered O. G, B is a tangent. Keyword, tangent. What do we know about tangents? Tan chord. Okay, do we actually have a chord though? Hmm, no, because we don't have a chord that goes across. We do have BS, but it doesn't go into a triangle. But what do we have? We have a tangent and a radius. Now, what do we know about tangents and radii? We know that they are 90. Okay, they've told me FE is produced to meet the tangent at G. FE is produced. OT is drawn such that T is a midpoint. So T is a midpoint. So there we've got a midpoint. Do we have a line from the center to the midpoint of a chord? We do. What does that tell me? Ah, oh, so many keywords in here. And they've told me a new thing. PS is parallel to GF. So PS is down here. GF is over here. We have parallel lines, which means straight away we are thinking corresponding co-interior alternate. Okay, lots of information. They want us to prove that O, T, B, G is a cyclic quad. Okay, let me grab my highlighter. O, T, B, G is a cyclic chord. Now this picture is so teeny tiny, it's hard to see what we're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of some of the highlighting here, just so we can see it a bit clearer. We are now looking, let's make this a thin line. We're looking here. There's my cyclic chord that I'm trying to prove. What do I know? From the story, I know that we have a radius perpendicular to a tangent. And I also know that I have this line from center that I saw here. There's my little, I'm gonna make this a bit thinner so that we can see it. Line from center here. What do we know about line from center? It's also at 90. Okay, maybe there's something there for you to look at. I'm going to give you six minutes to try see if you can find the information and write it down correctly to prove the cyclic quad. Okay, off you go. For those of you who have already done it, you're welcome to carry on with 9.2.2. And for those of you who are finished, we're gonna be moving on to Euclidean geometry grade 12 after this. So you guys can just um, rest for a few minutes. Right, so we're looking at five minutes. Okay. So let's have a look at what we've got so far. Okay, so looking at what we started with, I'm hoping you saw we have this little 90 over here. And then we had a teeny tiny little 90 in the middle. And I think this was a tough one because it was hard to see 
the bow tie. Okay, but there's a 90 in the middle over there. And if we put those two 90s together, we have a bow tie here. Let's see if I can get that line straight. So there it is. It's a bow tie. And at the top of the bow tie, we've got two 90s. So we actually have enough to prove angles in the same segment. Okay, so now let's have a look at how we write it down. So the first thing we're going to say is that this angle over here, OTG, is 90 degrees because of line from center to the midpoint of the chord. Now remember, it's always tempting to say line from center perpendicular, but ask yourself, what have they given me? They've given me the fact that it's a midpoint. So that is my reason. Line from center to midpoint chord. And you'll see that you get one mark for the statement, one mark for the reason. The other thing you've noticed is that we have angle B to be 90. Reason, tangent perpendicular to radius. So there's another statement reason mark. Now we need to tie it together. Remember I said to you, we must link the information. We are saying that it's a cyclic quad because the angles in the same segment are equal. What are those two angles? Well, it's angle B equaling angle OTG. So that is the link. And I want you to write it as a separate statement. It is so important. And now we can say that OTBG is a cyclic quad. And my reason is converse angles in the same segment, you'll see that they also accept line subtends equal angles. But that's not a reason that you guys may or may not be used to. I personally don't teach using that reason very often, but we do accept it. The reason that is preferred is converse angles in the same segment. And then you get a mark for that final reason. Okay, now we know that OTBG is a cyclic quad, and we can use all the information about the cyclic quad in any question that goes on afterwards. The next question was to prove that GOB, this angle here, is equal to angle S, which is this guy over here. And I'm hoping that you'll see that these parallel lines have something to do with it. Now, I'm going to give you four minutes to see if you can figure out what parallel lines are going to do to get angle S, this angle down here, to be equal to GOB, which is this angle here. Bearing in mind that you can use any property of your cyclic quad, because now we know that BGOT is a cyclic quad. You can use your bow ties, you can use opposite angle supplementary and exterior angles of triangle. I'm going to give you three minutes to have a look. Okay, so how many of you saw the teeny, teeny, tiny little angles in the same segment? This was a tough one to see. Okay, so they're wanting us to prove that S is the same as GOB, but to prove that we actually need to use our parallel lines. And once we've got our parallel lines, we need to use um, a bow tie. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can join this big F that we need to see here. So there's, oh, let's see if I can make it a straight line. There's my F. I hope you can see there's an F there, an upside down F. So if I use an upside down F, that means this angle here will be the same as that little angle over there, B, T, G. So if you want, you could let S be X, and then you could say that B, T, G is also X. And the reason for that is corresponding angles. Okay, so that's your first kind of line over here. Okay, remember, as soon as you use corresponding angles, you have to use the correct parallel lines. You can't just write corresponding angles and leave off the parallel lines. You're going to come short. Okay, so you must put in the parallel lines. 
Right, now's the tough part. We have G, B, T, O, G. And we have a crisscross here. I've drawn it a little bit bigger here. So we have this angle here, T. And if we have to do a bow tie, it is going to be B, O, G over there. So there is a bow tie here. That's super duper hard to see. And unfortunately, you can get a question like this in the final exam. You've got to be prepared for it. So there is an angles in the same segment, which proves that T equals O. Okay, so now remember I said if A equals B and B equals C, that means that A equals C. We've got that here. S equals T, but T equals G O B which means GOB has to be S. And so we've answered the question. Okay, so these last two were pretty tough and you might be feeling a little bit, oh, I don't like Euclidean. Just remember, it is hard, but we can do hard things. Right, we need to do one more bit of theory. We have just under, we've got about 35 minutes left, 30, half an hour left. I'm not gonna push you too hard. We're gonna do one more problem together and just have a look at the grade 12 theory. Okay, so let's have a look. Paula, just yes. before you go on, I think um, I just want to say Luke is really uh, participating very well today. And I think he maybe he's just writing in the chat as short as possible. But I just said, I saw he said T equals S, but there's a lot of angles at T and a lot of angles at S. So learners must just be careful to name the angles exactly correct like T1 or ATB or something like that, if there's more than one angle. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. And that's absolutely correct. Okay, so we've spent the majority of today focusing on grade 11 circle geometry. And guys, remember last section of the paper, these are the marks that we want to try and bank. What we're going to look at now is we're going to look at the very last question in the paper, sometimes the last two questions in the paper. The reality is if you're struggling with maths, you might not even get to this question because you'll run out of time. So remember, like I said at the beginning, we're not going to panic. We know that there are tough questions. That's okay. If I get a tough question, you're going to do what you can, take a breath, Remind yourself you can do hard things and you're going to carry on. Now, I did have a request in the chat to do November 2023, question 10. Um, for those of you who are interested, that was um, last year's uh, question 10. It was quite a tough question. I chose not to do it today purely because I want you guys to feel confident about the basics. And that question 10 from the November 2023 one was classified as complex. And it's actually classified as quite a hard, complex question. Um, and it would take a lot of time for us to go through together. So I'm going to choose to focus on the easier stuff um, and ask your teacher to help you with that question 10 from November 2023. Well, I, okay. I have put the memo of that question in the chat if that learner wants to go there. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so we're looking now at grade 12 Euclidean geometry. There's a few theorems that we need to remind ourselves about. Uh, let me just have a look here. So first one is from grade 10 is the midpoint theorem. We don't often see the midpoint theorem in the final exam, but it is something that you must remember. If I have a midpoint um, on one side of a triangle and I have another midpoint, then the line that joins those midpoints is parallel to the third side, to the bottom, and that DE is going to be half of BC. So that is a theorem that is worth having, but it links in quite nicely with the proportionality theorem. So if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about the midpoint theorem, don't worry. The midpoint theorem is also inside the proportionality theorem, which is much more important. So in grade 12, I'm hoping that at the start of this year, you learned about the proportionality theorem. It says, if I have a triangle with a parallel line in it, then that parallel line 
divides the two sides of the triangles in proportion. Meaning, if I have parallel lines, then AD over DB will be the same as AE over EC. Or AD over AB will be AE over AC. It doesn't matter which proportion you choose, as long as the shape, I call it the shape. So if we're going top over bottom on the one side of the triangle, you must go top over bottom on the other side of the triangle. Okay, this proportionality theorem has two reasons that you can use. Depending on which school you're at, your teacher might have taught you a different reason. I like using prop theorem, DE parallel to BC. You must have the parallel lines, non-negotiable. Or you could say line parallel to one side of triangle. Either one of those works. There is a converse theorem to this that says if you have two sides of a triangle that are in proportion, then the lines are parallel. And I haven't seen this used very often, but for those of you who want to remind yourself, it is the converse prop theorem. And the reason is line divides two sides of triangle in proportion. OK, now normally after your two circle geometry theorems, you're going to get a question that focuses on prop theorem. And we're going to practice one of those today before we go. Your last question in the paper is the humdinger. It's the one that uses similarity. And proving similarity is actually three or four marks that you can bank. It's easy. So I thought I'd remind you a little bit about that as well. So similar triangles are two triangles that have all the angles the same, but one is a little bit bigger than the other or a little bit smaller. OK, triangles are similar if all their angles have all their corresponding angles are equal or if the sides are in proportion. Now, a very typical question would be one like this, where they want you to true prove that triangle P Q R is similar to triangle RST. Now, the order of this is actually not correct, so let's fix it quickly. It is, I'm going to call it, let's just, it's, we're going to call it triangle RPQ, um, and we want to prove that it's similar to triangle RTS. Now, I'm just going to talk about the order quickly. If I look at these two triangles, let's grab my highlighter and let's highlight. We've got RPQ, which is this triangle at the top. And I've got RTS, which is this triangle at the bottom. This big one here. Sorry, it doesn't make nice straight lines. OK, in those two triangles, I should see straight away that angle R is in both of them. There's an angle R in the yellow triangle and an angle R in the green triangle. I also have parallel lines. And what do I know about parallel lines? As soon as you see parallel lines, you should be thinking fuzz. And so I know that this guy will equal that guy because of corresponding angles. And Q1 is going to be S because of corresponding angles. So I can prove similarity quite easily in these two triangles, but I must have the triangles in order. OK. So you'll see at the end here, the triangles are in a better order, PQR and TSR, PQR, TSR. That is the right order. The proof is actually very, very easy. The first thing you can state is angle R is common because it's in both triangles. And then you can pick either number two or number three. You can either say P1 equals T, corresponding angles, or you can say Q1 equals S, corresponding angles, OK? Or you could write all three. It doesn't matter. But you technically only need two of them. And your third one has to be the same because we know that angles in a triangle add up to 180. However, I always like stress to my kids, please make sure that whenever you are proving similarity, that you have your two or three angles and your conclusion that triangle PQR is similar to triangle TSR because of angle, angle, angle. Now, you can either have two angles 
and our AAA at the end. Or you can have your all three angles and then we're a little bit, then we, we use that third angle instead of your reason. But guys, play it safe. Play it safe, play it safe. Make sure you have at least your two angles and your reason. Always play it safe. If you can put in the third angle, put it in, it won't hurt. Okay, so that's three marks that you can grab. The other thing that you can grab, and this is my favorite part, is that we can use similarity to find ratios. And I call this frog face. And I don't know if any of you have heard of this before. Let me just get this out of the way so we can read. Um, if you've seen the frog face, so once we have our triangles that are similar, we can find the ratios from them. And that's why it's so important that your order is correct. Okay, if your order is correct, we can do frog face. And my matrix always laugh at me because I insist on drawing a little froggy on every single similarity that I've got because it really helps me remember. So I hope you see there's these little eyeballs and there's the little frog face. Okay, so what do we know? We know that PQ divided by TS will be the same as QR divided by SR, which will be the same as PR divided by TR. Okay, so as soon as you have proved similarity, you can write down the triangles in order and you can write down all your ratios using frog face. And very often, there's one mark allocated for just writing down that step, even if you do nothing else. Okay, so let's go up to this top triangle over here. They say triangles are similar if corresponding angles are in proportion, or corresponding angles are equal and the sides are in proportion. How can they ask similarity? Well, the first question, they can ask you to prove the triangles. Or sometimes they don't ask you to prove the triangles, but they ask you to prove ratios. So they'll give you something like this. And this is quite a common question, and there's a neat little trick to help you, because I think often you just leave it out because you think it's going to be too hard. But have a look here. If you grab your highlighter and you highlight across the top and you highlight across the bottom, you can sometimes see the triangles that you need. So if I look at the top P, Q, Q, R, P, Q, R, and I look at my picture, P, Q, R, that's a triangle. If I look at the bottom, D, E, E, F, D, E, F, D, okay, obviously that picture doesn't relate to this picture, but D, E, F might be a triangle. So then you can prove those triangles are similar and then use your frog face to get your ratios. Okay, so that's a little recap about the Euclidean geometry. We're going to finish off today with our last question, guys. You have been absolute rock stars. We're going to do our very last question. Um, we are looking at June 2024. It is um, page 12 in your learner book, page 14 in your um, workbook. I want us, it takes a little bit um, of everything. So I want you to look at, well, actually, I don't think I want to do this one. Let's do this one rather. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, it is the proportionality theorem and similarity. We're going to finish off with this. And I only want us to focus on 9.1 and 9.2. So please go to page 22 in your learner book, page 25 in your workbook. We are going to practice prop theorem and similarity. And this will be our very last one, guys. I'm so proud of you. You guys are amazing. Okay. Let us read the question, and then I'll give you some time to finish it off. In the diagram, ABCD is a parallelogram with AB equal to 14 units. So straight away, use your picture, put the 14 on your picture, and this is units. AD is produced to E such that AD to DE is four to three. Now the temptation is to make this four and three, but you don't know that it's four and three. We know the ratio is four to three. So you must put in a variable. Okay, so for this, you must use a variable. You can use a letter, 
you can use X, you can use P. I'm choosing P, P for Paolo, that's my name. So I chose a P. Okay. They've also told me that the whole of EB is 21. So I'm going to highlight the whole of EB and that is 21 units. Okay, now, what do I know that I don't know that I know? They've been a bit sneaky. I know that this line is parallel to this one, which means straight away, if you have a look here, you have a prop theorem. Do you see? You have a triangle with a parallel line. So if this ratio is 3 to 4, that means the other side must also be 3 to 4. Okay, that should help you to tackle 9.1. Let's read 9.2. They want us to prove that triangle EDF, which is this one over here, is similar to triangle EAB, which is the big triangle. So EDF is this one, and EAB is the big green one. Okay, this looks very familiar. We've seen this one before in the theory that I just showed you. Parallel lines, that should be easy to prove. And those six marks, right near the end of the paper, you can get. Okay, it is six marks. I'm going to give you seven minutes. I'm not going to give you the full seven minutes. I'm going to give you six minutes because I want us to finish a little bit early um, and I want us, we still need to do the register and a little bit of admin. So let's go six minutes for the six marks and then we'll mark and we'll be done. Right, guys, we've made it. It's our last question of the day. So let's have a look. So we're wanting to finish off um, what we've worked through with question nine. We're looking at the proportionality theorem. It says that if I have a line parallel, then it divides the sides of the triangle in proportion. They want us to find the length of FB. So FB is this part down here. We know that the whole length of EB is 21. We also know that the side EA is cut in the proportion 3 to 4. And I told you, you've got to be careful that you don't make it 3 and 4, because then you're assuming that the length is 3 and the length of DA is 4, which we can't assume. So we introduce a variable. I chose P because my name is Paula, but you could have used an A, a B, or an X. Okay, so the cool thing is, if you draw this in on your picture, the answer kind of pops out already. We're trying to find FB, so I definitely am going to have FB as one of my ratios. But then looking at this side, the only other side I've got is the whole length. So I'm going to say FB over the whole length EB. And now I need to pair it with its partner on the other side. And on the other side, it would be DA, which is the bottom, and the whole thing, EA. Okay, let's see if we can make that a bit nicer. EA, DA at the bottom, and then the whole thing, EA. So FB over the whole thing, EB, is equal to DA over the whole thing, EA. And what is my reason? Prop theorem with my parallel lines. Okay, you must put in those parallel lines. Now I'm going to plug and play what I have. So FB is what I'm looking for. EB is the whole thing, 21. DA is just the bottom, which was 4P. And then EA was the whole thing, which was my 3P and my 4P, which gave me 7P. And you'll notice that straight away those P's are going to cancel. Okay, then I will be left with FB just equal to 4 times 21. Now, they haven't put this middle step in in the memo, so I've just written it in for you guys here. They've jumped straight to FB equals 4P times 21 over 7B. That means you do get 12, so that was the right numerical answer, but there's a lot more working that I need to see. Okay, so I need to see some sort of proportionality, either something like that or maybe something like this. Um, we need to see some sort of proportionality. So either this one or this step or this step, somewhere, one of those three steps and your reason. Then final mark, 12. If you just write FB equals 12 prop theorem, you might not get all the answers, we, all the marks. We really do want to see all of your ratios. Okay, last question. We need to prove that EDF 
is similar to EAB. Okay, so let's highlight them quickly. EDF is this triangle at the top and EAB is the big triangle. Okay, and I'm going to make this one in blue. Nice for us to see. So this one's quite nice to see because we have parallel lines and we have a common angle. So the first thing we can say is that angle E is common and that gave you your very first tick. If that was all you did, you got one mark in the bag. Okay, then we've got a look. So you can use corresponding angles here and you can say EDF equals angle A. Be careful not to just call it D because there's actually two angles at D. So you have to call it EDF. But A you can just call A because there's only one angle. And there's your second angle. Now remember I told you, you only really need to give me two angles. That's enough as long as you give me this reason AAA at the end. And uh, you can either write it with the letter A or you can draw angle, angle, angle. The other option is that you give me the third angle for corresponding um, angles or um, interior angles of a triangle, either one. Okay. It's sneaky because you think this is a really tough question, but it's actually quite accessible when you get going. Okay, guys, it's 10 to 3. You have done a monumental amount of work today. I just want to remind you about a few basics before I hand over to Elaine. She needs to do um, the register and the feedback. But let's just remind ourselves about a, a few things before we go. Okay, number one, do not forget this magic study page. Where is it? Let's go back, go back, go back, go back. No, further on. It is that magic cheat sheet. Oh gosh, it's all the way on. Let's keep going. Go, 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 go. I went back way I too far. Yeah. I will find it. This one here. Don't forget this cheat sheet. Guys, this is gold. And don't forget to study your reasons. Okay, so if those are the two things that I could send home with you, don't panic. Remember the basics. And remember, this might feel hard, but you can do hard things. Thank you very much, you guys.